On the surface, Football Index looked like a breakthrough in football betting. It was strewn across football shirts in the championship and featured on the biggest radio stations and podcasts in the UK. Listeners, if you want to combine your knowledge of the footy with your knowledge of the footsie, then you need to get yourself over to the Football Stock Market Football Index. But now, after six years, Football Index is going into administration. Was it a Ponzi scheme? How could something like this happen? And what does it mean for the thousands of users who have been left high and dry? We explore those questions and more on Football Today. I'm Dave, and I'm from Watford, which is uh, just outside of London. Dave has been a Football Index user for the last two years. And for security reasons, we've chosen to only use his first name. I had seen lots of adverts, sometimes online, sometimes on the billboards around the the stadiums. Uh, I'd seen things on my phone, but I'd never really had much interest in using it because it was such a brand new product. I'd looked slightly into the dividend structures, which is which is how you win money, and it seemed to be that you had to invest quite a lot of money to get any decent returns. So I'd always kept it in the back of my mind. It's something I was interested in because it was football related and gambling related to things that I enjoy. But it was a friend of mine who had been using the index for about six months at the time that I had spoken to, and that was what encouraged me to actually initially invest my my money in football index. What really appealed to you about the platform? So, like I say, I really enjoy football. It's my passion. It's my love. I watch as many games as I am able to without getting in trouble with the wife. And I also enjoy gambling. You know, I've I've actually had shares in racehorses and I've had a background in the bookmaking industry as well. So it was something that combined two passions of mine and potentially made them profitable because the returns that were on offer were, were quite exciting to me. The other element of it is it was a long-term bet. So, for example, if you put £10 on a horse, within a couple of minutes, you've either won or lost that money. Whereas on Football Index, if you invested in a player, that bet would last a minimum of three years. So there was there was a lot of talk about a three-year expiry on the bets. But actually, during the time I've been on the index, they haven't actually implemented that. So they don't technically have an expiry date at, at this moment in time. So you could invest in a player and just continue to earn and earn and earn on the same player. So once you've made that investment, it just sits there and you can just enjoy the returns, enjoy every single game that that player that you've invested in plays, you can enjoy. So for example, someone like if you own Bruno Fernandes, you could watch every single Manchester United game and enjoy every single goal or assist that he gets game after game without having to put any extra money in to get that enjoyment. You said that your friend said that it took a lot to invest initially in Football Index. How much money did you invest when you first got on the platform? So initially what I did was I put £100 in and I went around buying the most random bunch of players that you could imagine. Absolutely terrible investments. Um, I The first player I bought was Ravel Morrison, who was a bit of a, a bad boy <laughs> uh, football player that had been released from Manchester United, gone around many different clubs, but was back in the premiership at Sheffield United. And the way I viewed the platform as I, as I just started was that I was looking for people that were going to be in the press a lot, that were going to get a lot of exposure. And that was the way I'd sort of plan to earn my money. But actually, it was the best thing I could have done was actually make terrible investments at a small stake because it taught me a lot about the platform. And I started to learn. I started to delve further into the platform and how it worked, how people traded. I got online. I got onto Twitter. I spoke to friends about it. And we and I started to improve uh, the way I trade and the way I invested. So actually, I lost on that initial hundred pound investment and I traded terribly, but it didn't put me off the platform because it showed me 
yes, you can lose money, but also if you trade well, you can make money. And I saw the returns that were available by joining the Twitter community and through my friend who was doing very well. And that was what encouraged me as I was learning to, to invest more money. And then after the first, I think it was the first month of my investment, as I started to improve and learn and gain extra knowledge, I um, actually came across some inheritance, which was uh, around £10,000. And I decided to put three quarters of that into Football Index. The reason I did that was because I'd looked at many different ways of investing my money, for example, like ISAs, and they just didn't give me the returns that were available at that particular time uh, on Football Index, and they didn't give me the enjoyment. So I felt comfortable investing that money because I I didn't need the money. I wasn't overexposing myself. I didn't ha- have that need to pay bills with it. So I thought this could be a really exciting way to invest my money. And although I say I invested that £7,500, I didn't necessarily do it all in one go. It was a dribs and drabs. I put it in there and I chose my moments and I picked my players. And I started to see that that money was really working for me. And I was earning you know, some really nice capital appreciation on different players. And there was some dividends coming in. And it, 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 it seemed like a great investment at the time. You mentioned before a little bit how the dividends work. Can you describe in a little bit more detail how this platform functions and maybe how it's a little bit different from gambling because it marketed itself as kind of the stock market for football? That's correct. Yeah. So they had always marketed themselves as being almost superior to your high street bookmaker. Football Index is reinventing football betting. You can buy and sell the world's top players. Their value may go up and down, but it's not over with the final whistle like a regular bet. You get to stay in the game. A better, more scalable option. So the main reason for people to invest in Football uh, Index was the dividends that were on offer. And how that works is that if you invest in a player and that player does well, either by performing on the pitch or being mentioned in the media, they would win dividends. So to give you an example, a player I am already mentioned was Bruno Fernandes for the reason I'm using him as an example because he was one of the, the best trades that I made. So if you put enough money to buy 100 shares in Bruno Fernandes, every time that he was the most mentioned player in the media on that particular day, he would win dividends. Now, if, if there was no game on, that would be 6p per day. So that equates to... If you had 100 shares, you'd win £6 for that day in dividends. When there was games on the same day, that would slightly reduce to 5p and he would win £5. Now, the real exciting aspect was what they call PB, which is performance-based dividends. Uh, How that worked was we based the players' scores on how they performed in that game. So it would be tackles, interceptions, passes, shots, goals, every, every little aspect of the game and their performance would add up to a total score. And if that player won the performance dividends, that was where the real money could be made. So for example, until the structure changed recently, if there was a goal day, which meant there was 14 or more matches being played on that particular day, if your player had the top score on that day, he'd win 28p per share in dividends. So you can imagine with 100 shares, you win £28. But with 1,000 shares, you win £280. And, you know, there are people out there that have 10,000 shares in, in players like Bruno Fernandes, and they're really able to see some large returns coming back. But like I say, the beauty of that is not only could you win that 28p, he might also score the winning goal and be in the media. So you win 33p that day on one player, that return coming back. And the greatest part of that is that you can do it all again the next week. You know, So you're not just winning that dividend that day and it's like that quick buzz. It's you've won that money and then you're accumulating those dividends. So they get paid instantly into your account within 24 hours. You've got that money. So say say it's two hundred pounds sitting there. You can withdraw that. There was you know there was no problem with that. You could withdraw as much money as you wanted, but you could also reinvest that and keep compounding your investment to get higher returns. And I think that was the excitement with the index is that you could enjoy watching your player win. You could earn loads of money in dividends, and it was just there to go the next week, the next week, the next week, and you could just enjoy watching all these games with all your players in. It sounds almost like fantasy in that regard, except with 
you know, real life money on the line, coming and going, fluctuating every week. And so it kind of gives you that interest in not just your team, uh, but in any team or every team. Correct, correct. And that's what drew drew a lot of us in. So I've got quite a lot of friends and family invested. And as I've mentioned to you before, there's an online community on Twitter. Uh, I'm sure there's Facebook groups and all other uh, social media platforms as well, where you could really enjoy this fantasy style product. So people could really enjoy not only the aspect of winning money, but actually their passion, which is football, speaking about you know the different games that are going on um i think it was often a joke uh between myself and my friends that you know we'd end up watching the most obscure matches if there was only one match on that day and it happened to be you know can you give me an example (laughs) oh it, it could literally be i mean there was for example european games when rangers were playing the other week against antwerp you know if you had a rangers player in that game you were watching that game and you were enjoying it and uh, that, funny enough those were two really high scoring games and people would have loved to enjoy them but they probably would have never watched that game if they didn't have you know an investment in it and i think that is the beauty of what this product is i mean regardless of any money won or lost in the past the concept of this product is exceptional and I think that everyone that has invested in the platform and enjoyed the platform still agrees with that, regardless of what has gone on in recent weeks. And I think that's the most disappointing thing for everyone is that, that we are losing out on a, on our biggest passion enjoyment that we've had. And especially as you can probably imagine during lockdown, where a lot of us feel completely trapped, we're not able to go out and enjoy ourselves. We've had this release you know, we've had this enjoyable product that's kept us going all the way, you know, and I think that's the thing that disappoints people more than, than anything else. I, I, I'm only speaking for myself here, regardless of the money that I've lost and how frustrating that is for me. I'm actually more disappointed about the fact that I can't enjoy the product I love and enjoy watching those games as much as I did before. So like a, a loss of community. Exactly. Yeah, the community is a big part of it, but the the product itself. Mm. So although they haven't gone out of business and I haven't actually officially lost my money yet because it's still there and there's a potential that it may change down the line, it doesn't have the same enjoyment because there is this overlying black cloud over, over what's happened, which has kind of brought our enjoyment of the product down to to almost zero now to the fact that we don't even want to look at it anymore until something happens, something changes you know how much would you say that over the course of your time on the platform have you invested on the site so as i mentioned before i had this initial investment which was seven and a half thousand pounds and then what i tended to do is deposit 50 pounds here 100 pounds there 200 pounds there i'm very much a sporadic trader in that respect i there's a lot of other traders that would put big lump sums in on maybe a quarterly or yearly basis whereas i was very much like oh you know put a couple of hundred pounds in buy this player see what happens and it was only recently that i realized how much that had built up to to the fact that it was actually almost twenty thousand pounds that i'd invested into the product wow yeah so It is a a hell of a lot of money. And that's, that's, that's the thing. It's like, that's how good the product was. And that's how much I believed in it, that I was happy to invest. I would like to touch on the fact that, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff online from people saying people like myself are, are idiots or we're stupid or we deserve to lose our money because we should have never have, thrown so much into a platform like this i've seen accusations that it's a ponzi scheme none of this information is true you know when i initially made my investment and the investment since that was on of, of course on good faith like with anything else but there were promises made consistently down the line which had given us the belief that the platform was in great health and that they were in a strong financial position. We've just become a tier one operator and with it has come an enormous amount of um, compliance scrutiny. But we will make sure 
that there are liquidity providers mm -hmm. um, that perform that function. So, just like any market, we have we have entities that will, and there are many of them out there um, in all markets. You know, there are liquidity providers that provide that function, and it's a well established role in a market. Uh, and we will make sure that that the market functions and that there is liquidity in the market, just as we've done for the last two and a half years. We were backing the company just as much as we were backing the players that we were investing in. We were believing in what they were showing us and they were telling us. And although it seems like a lot of money, when it's built up over time and you've invested not only the, the cash that you've, you've got uh, physically, but also the dividends that you're earning, builds up quite quickly and I, I don't feel like I've got a, a problem with gambling or I've overextended myself you know if I walk away today and I've lost all the money that I've invested it's in the nicest way possible I, I appreciate it's a lot of money but it's not going to make a difference in my life I'm not going to I'm not going to get thrown out of my house I'm not going to be you know on the streets or anything like that but has it really upset me has it mentally affected me of course you know no one can lose that amount of money and not feel completely and utterly dejected but the worst part of it all is the fact that there has been no communication since to offer any form of sympathy or empathy about the situation i think that's that's really been the most frustrating thing so we've kind of been dancing around it a little bit but what we're talking about happened last friday when football index held a, a q a but before we get to what was said in that q a what's the importance or relevance of a q a with football index and you know how common are these for for someone who's uh not used to the platform okay so just to give you an idea of the, the history of football index when i first started there was a lot of money to be made uh, you could invest in a player at one pound uh, and then the next week he could be three pound or four pound. And there was a, you know, there were pe people making very, very large sums of money. We had COVID hit and the whole dynamic of the platform changed. So over that, that time, there was Q and A's and the Q and A's were often used to boost the platform, to deliver really exciting news that would either be an increase in dividends or there would be something new in a technology or there would be rumors about expanding to different regions such as Germany. So every time there was a Q&A, there was usually something really big, something really excited that was announced during these Q&As. So just before this, this Friday announcement, which, which we were speaking about, uh, the CEO had come on camera and said, there's going to be a Q&A. We need to have a chat. Let's speak about the big important points send your questions and i'm going to answer this q a and i'm really looking forward to it so from the community's point of view this is a really positive step you know we've got this new ceo that's come in slowly but surely he's been making positive changes and now he's delivering us this really positive video that's telling us that you know there's going to be a q a and we're all believing at this point although it hasn't been said it's been insinuated that something positive is going to happen so what, what tends to happen with the market when a Q&A is announced is that a lot of money is invested, more players' prices go up, and there's a general positive feel around the place. So what did they say in this Q&A that caused kind of all this mayhem? Okay, so as you can imagine, we've all waited you know, patiently for this Q&A. When it was initially announced, there was... It, we were told it was going to be some point in the next week. We all waited that whole week. Nothing happened. Nothing was said. And then on the Friday, we then had communication, which was to tell us, ah, sorry, it's been delayed for another week. So again, more money came in, more excitement built up. The next week comes. It's Friday. Still nothing. And then suddenly this push notification comes through to tell us that the market is going to be suspended, which is a very, very unusual step. It happens and it's usually suspended for maybe half an hour or an hour Well, like a big bonus or something interesting happens that they want to let everyone digest the information that comes on, um, comes out in their communications. So no one gets an unfair advantage to buy X player or Y player first. So, you know, 
Although it was an unusual step, it, again, at this point, we weren't too worried. We just thought the, the information could be so good and so exciting that by closing the market for basically the whole entire night and most of the morning, that this was this was going to be a positive thing. I actually went on the app. I saw people depositing more money, spending more money, players flying, you know, off the shelves. So it was all seen as positive. There's no argument about that. But eventually at 8 p.m., this announcement comes through and the announcement was that they were going to decrease the dividend from their current structure. Uh, they explained that they were struggling financially to keep paying the dividends that were on offer and they were going to change the structure. So instead of having this really exciting sort of jackpot scenario where you can win a massive payout in one day, all the payments were restricted per league so and per position. So there are more chances to win, but if you win, the, the returns are very, very small. What that effectively did was reduce the current dividends on offer by around 70 to 80% per player. But it also meant that pl- uh, people like myself that had backed the platform invested large amounts of money in players at what we would call premium prices no longer had a chance to win their money back. So just to give you an idea, we spoke about these great returns like 28p on a gold day. Now you would win the maximum of three pence on a gold day. So you can imagine the huge difference in the what you can or can't win. And that was announced with a statement, not a Q&A, which had been promised. We still haven't seen this Q&A. It was a statement that was released online There was no apology. There was no offer of hope. There was no remorse in what had happened. It was just like, this is what you're getting and you better get used to it quickly. So just to kind of summarize what you're saying, essentially, they changed the dividend structure so drastically that the values of these players dropped around 70 or 80%. And therefore, I mean, if you're talking about investing thousands of dollars, you're going to lose, you know, a vast majority of that money. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I, I'm just going to give you an idea and just going to be completely open and honest about my particular path of the trading. So I'm, I'm just loading up now to, to give you the exact figure that my portfolio is worth. So right now, if I was to sell my portfolio at what they call the, this, this, sell price which is what the lowest offer is for that player at the moment my portfolio benchmark is three thousand pounds so uh, effectively from from its highest point it's about twenty thousand pounds down from from its highest point so if you include all the dividends i've earned and everything else so since friday my portfolio has gone down about twelve thousand pounds which is quite remarkable considering, you know, this was not based on any games, anything that happened in the media, nothing you did, nothing, you know, anyone else really did to kind of bring this on. Um, it was just kind of a unilateral decision by the company. So, so why do you think they did that? So Football Index have been struggling to pay out the large amounts of dividends. From their side, as well as ours, it's a bit of a gamble. So if you can imagine a player like Jade and Sancho was the top player on the index in terms of price now the reason that he was top was that most people owned him and most people had 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 invested in him he's a young player that is in the media a lot he's well ahead of most people in his generation in terms of his output on the field so he was a great investment for lots of traders and obviously a lot of money went into him but the problem that would happen is that if he won the pb or the MB, the two dividends on offer, that that would cost Football Index a lot of money. And the problem they had is that they didn't have a way to to sort of offload this exposure to to these dividends. So they had, you know, 800,000 shares in Jadon Sancho out there. And when he wins, they're losing a lot of money. The same with Bruno Fernandes and other key premium players. Now, the way that they had planned to offset those those large costs was there to be a really buoyant market where there was a lot of trading going on. And that's where FI make their money. So there's 2% commission on offer for them for every trade that's made. So if you're trading 
Sancho at what his all-time high price was before fifteen pounds. That's a lot of commission for them to to be making. You know, two percent every time without really having to do anything. They're only facilitating the transaction. But unfortunately, due to the implementation of order books, which is probably been being the main downfall of the product. Prices and players fluctuated so much and tended to hit a downward curve. And therefore, there was a lot less trading. And the trading that was happening was at a much lower price point to what they had expected. Unfortunately, instead of addressing the issue and finding ways around that and finding ways to increase the prices of players and get us back on that upward curve of where we, we are, they decided that they need to cut their losses while they can and basically force the market into to a downward pressure so they didn't have such a high exposure at dividends. This, uh, into this journey with order books, which is a really exciting time for us to kind of really establish ourselves as a really highly credible market in the scheme of those things. You mentioned that you think one of the downfalls was these order books. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, of course. Sorry. So this this is a, a very, very important part of Football Index and where things have gone wrong. So when I initially began using the product, there was what they called an in, instant sell option. So if you bought a player for five pounds and, you know, a couple of days later, you thought, well, oh, I've made a bit of a mistake here and I just want to just want to get rid of that player. I don't want to use him. There was always an option to instantly sell that player with a click of a button and recover a majority of your stake. So if that player was five pounds, Football Index would buy him back straight away for maybe four pounds sixty, four pounds fifty. So you'd lose you'd lose some money. You might lose twenty percent, but you were happy because you could trade in and out of players really quickly. And it also offered you like a strong feeling that the company were reliable and trustworthy. They're giving you this option to take your money back. You didn't feel as if it would ever be trapped in there. Um, but unfortunately as you know, you know, COVID's hit and a lot of companies were in a place where they were struggling financially or there was an inclination that money would disappear because COVID. Now, football was one of those industries that were hit by COVID in, in terms of there was a lack of games. Everything was closing down. A lot of the leagues stopped playing. So therefore, we weren't able to earn our dividends from playing uh, playing this game because Teams weren't playing football, therefore we couldn't win the performance-based dividends. With that in mind, a lot of people then started to panic sell their players using the instant sell um, function that was available at the time. As you can imagine, Football Index couldn't just completely let every person on the index sell every single player because that would be the end of their business, but also a lot of people would lose a lot of money. So they did what was the correct decision at the time, which was to suspend the market review their options, and they removed, at that particular time, the instant sell function. Now, this upset a lot of people because they felt that that changed the complete rules of the game, that we had this really safe bet, and now that option had gone to just withdraw money. But it was an understandable decision that was made at the time because people were panicking and they were selling out of panic rather than actually because they wanted to. It was a case of like, I need to get out now before everyone else gets out first because I'm going to be the last one out the door with left of nothing. So it was a good decision at the time. We are, we all understood it. But in order to have a functioning market, they needed to replace this instant sell function. And they did that by implementing these order books that I mentioned. Now, how order books work is that you can, as a trader, dictate the prices of the players. You can either do that by bidding on a player. So if player X is £10, you can bid £9.50. And if someone wants to get rid of that player quickly, they'll just accept your offer and you you then own no shares. Um, Football Index make a commission of 4% this time because they get 2% from the person bidding and 2% from the person selling. Um, and the other way to use the order book system is to what they call offer, which is to sell the player. But you put an offer of your own. So if the lowest offer on the market now is £10, you can say, I just really want to sell this player. I'm going to put this player on the market for £9.80. And then you can sell a, a cheaper price than what else is available. So people will obviously pick up that player and then you then take the money. What actually happened at the start of 
order books was there was a downward pressure on the market. So as you can imagine, a lot of people have got used to making easy money and having this great instant sell option. Now there's a new market and you're given the option to dictate the prices of players. But people have never had this before. They, they've got this responsibility and they don't know what to do with it. And suddenly they see player X that was £10, his price has suddenly gone to £7 because everyone's racing to get sell the player first. And there's no realisation that, you know, we're actually just dropping the players' prices on our own. This is nothing to do with Football Index. This is just traders themselves that are dropping these prices. I personally believe that there should have been more information around order books and how they work. Because even just explaining it to you now, I feel that there'll be a lot of people listening that will still fail to grasp the the aspects of what I'm explaining. Not not because they're not intelligent, but because it is a complicated matter. And without having it in front of you, without being able to use it, without having a tutorial, it's not something that a lot of people are feeling comfortable with. Now, imagine giving that to this new tool that someone's never used in their life, but you're giving it to them and they're in, they're responsible for it, but they've got thousands and thousands of pounds worth of shares that they've got to trade with, with a tool that they don't know how to use. And that was where the beginning of the end started in, in, in my opinion. And I, I think a lot of other traders, they were, this new tool comes in, which allows people to completely and utterly dictate this market and, by doing that, you're always going to have people that are going to take advantage. And there was a lot of people trading to crash the market, to bring prices down so they could buy back at a cheaper rate, which was great for them. But obviously, it continued a downward pressure. And then it then put us in a situation where we are now, where football index weren't making enough commission. They weren't trading players at their highest price where what they would do. So, so for example... I know I'm going a bit off topic here, but for example, when a player reaches their all-time high price, every share that's bought goes into Football Index's pocket. So if you had Sancho trading, trading at £15 a share and someone buys 100 that's £1,500 of cash, cold hard cash that goes into the Football Index coffers. But if I'm buying and selling that player to, to different traders, they're only getting 4% of that transaction. It's a huge difference. So I think they never actually understood the dynamics of this market were going to actually really pull back their earnings. But at the same time, that people are going to take advantage of it and traders were going to be trading players at all-time low prices. Now, something I saw online is there were screenshots of a football index customer service message that were going around on, on Twitter. And, you know, it said, quote, at the time of the communication, football index had substantial cash reserves. However, in the coming months, football index sustained consistent and substantial losses due to a very low deposit levels, which depleted their reserves, end quote. And so I, I saw a lot of people kind of made of that. That is what kind of made it almost like a Ponzi scheme in that they relied on the deposit levels. What do you make of that statement? I, I think that's an irresponsible statement for them to make. I think it's poor communication from them because I understand where they're coming from when they say that, but that is not the the driving factor in why we're in this situation today. The driving factor behind it was that they poorly planned this whole order book system and they poorly planned their dividend increase. So if you can imagine with any company, when you do something as important as increase dividends, which it increases massively their exposure, they almost doubled them, you know, during the pandemic this wasn't you know years ago when they had loads of money and everything was rosy during the pandemic they increased dividends by almost double now to do that you would imagine that they would have done their due diligence they would have done their maths they would have done their sums they would have looked at the worst case scenario to ensure that there was no way that they were paying out too much money or putting themselves in a very rough financial position as I touched on earlier, I'm a business owner myself. The first thing I do when I price up a client, when I look at their needs, 
when I do my sums is I look at the worst case scenario. I don't look at the best case scenario and say, oh, look, I can make millions here. I go, what is the worst case that could possibly happen here? Right. And if I price it at this and they spend the minimum amount possible, what am I going to make? And that's the base of any solid business foundation is to look at the worst case. Of course, we want to forecast, you know, great things and think that everyone's going to spend loads of money. But the crux of it is they should have made sure that they could afford this dividend increase before they do it, regardless of them blaming people for spending too much money or not enough money or not putting enough deposits in. That is the main issue here. And I just wanted to say that before I go on to talk about the Ponzi scheme, because this is the the overbearing factor here is that they have made the mistakes here, not the traders. You know, they're the business owners. They're the people that we give our money to and trust in. And they've let us down massively. But to touch on the Ponzi scheme thing, yes, I understand why people are saying that. And I understand how reading that statement, you would you would look at it and say, well, hang on a second. You know, if they are requiring people to spend new money all the time and new deposits to come in to make money, that is the hallmark of a, a Ponzi scheme. But I don't believe that actually is the case here, you know, because if you look at the the simple facts of how the dynamics of the market work and how players are priced, that's where money is won or lost. So say, for example, just going back, I know I keep using examples, but it's probably the best way for people to understand. If you've got Sancho at £10 that I've bought, say, say just for one share at £10, how many times do I have to win dividends to make back that £10? Even if he wins these gold days I've been talking about at 28p, how many times does he have to do that to recover that money? You know, this we're talking, it's not going to be for three, four, five years, really. Realistically, yes, there's, there's a potential that he could go on a great run of form and he win media, but these were long-term bets and investments. And every time I invest... Ten pounds in a Sancho, or you know, people are investing. I've seen people with quarter of a million pounds worth of Sancho's. You know, serious money. Where is that money going? That's going to Football Index, and they it sits in their bank account, earning you know interest, and they only have to pay us out when Sancho wins. There's no guarantee he wins. What what happens if he gets injured for a year? They still keep that money. Yes, we can sell, but we'd have to sell to another trader. Football Index still keep the money that Sancho was bought at. It's only since the the order book system came in that changed the way things work and the dynamics. But for me, a Ponzi scheme is where you just need constant investment all the time and you're using that investment to pay people out. But that's not the case with this because we've got a dividend structure. That's the crux of how this works is that you're investing in something you know is not going to return straight away. It's a long-term bet, and that was that was the the pull for people. Of course, any business needs new money to survive. Any business, you know, that doesn't make it a Ponzi scheme. A stock market rise and falls on how many people are investing and how many people are taking their money out. That's just a normal business structure. I agree. If we were just buying players for the sake of buying players, and no one really had an idea why they were doing it, that would be a Ponzi scheme. But because we're buying these and investing in their long-term dividends, that made it a completely different business. So I think, yes, there is an element of them needing new money, but I think they only needed that new money that they've suggested in that email because of the mistakes they've made, because they've overexposed themselves, because they've made bad decisions consistently for the last 12 months. And I think that's where we are now because of the decisions they've made, not because of anything that traders have done. There were, you know, some yellow flags, some red flags even. You know, why weren't you concerned about these warnings? You know, was there anything that you thought like legitimized the company or you thought, you know, oh, I can really trust these guys? Josh, that that is such a great point. And you, you, you've you hit the nail on the head there. There were a lot of red flags and there were people, not just Carnberry, but a number of people that had become almost flag bearers for people to leave the the, the football index and, and warning us of all these different signs, all these different things that could potentially happen, which would ruin the, the platform, which would make us lose our money. Now, 
there was a few issues with that. One is that this sort of abuse of the platform, accusations of it being a Ponzi scheme, that had been happening since day one, since I'd used Football Index. So it was always something that you heard or became used to hearing. So it almost made you grow thick skin to people you know, criticizing the platform and saying all these things. One of the key points which Calm Berry raised was that the terms and conditions allow Football Index to change the dividend structure at any point with 30 days notice. And the reason why I didn't I I didn't take that very seriously was because I knew if they did that, that would be the end of the platform. I knew that would, you know, put us where we are now. So I never believed that that was something that Football Index would ever seek to do. You know, they'd constantly reassured us of their financial security, you know, only a couple of months ago telling us it's the strongest it's ever been. But for me, the key factor in my constant belief was, one, that we had this amazing platform, which the concept still is the best out there, um, and it's it's completely unique to anything else. And I could see a way of this being hugely successful, and we thought this was just the beginning. We thought all these traders here that you, 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 you will see – we're all the same. We all thought we were right at the beginning of this amazing um, concept that was going to build and build and build and go global. So we understood there would be rocky roads. We understood there would be hard times, but we always backed the product and believed what we were told. But the, the second and probably most key factor was that this is a company that were licensed by the Gambling Commission. This is a company that you see on football uh, team shirts as, as a logo sponsor. This is a company that you see around every stadium in the company during games when you're watching them uh, either online or on you know any of the sports subscription channels. You see that name going around. Now, for me, if this company were dodgy or they were misrepresenting themselves – I wouldn't believe that they would be allowed to do this. To be all, hiding in plain sight is what they've basically done. And we have trust in the Gambling Commission and all these different authorities to do their job properly and protect our money. And the Gambling Commission was probably the main reason why we looked the other way when we heard all these red flags. And obviously now we, we all feel a little bit stupid, a little bit embarrassed. I think that's the majority of traders. That's the way they feel right now. They feel stupid. They feel embarrassed. They feel that we not only have been tricked, but we've actively, like I say, turned the other way when people have made these accusations. And that's something that's really hard to take for a lot of people. And I don't think it's anything where if you look at the community, there's people from all different backgrounds. It's not a lack of intelligence that led us this way. It's a belief in the, in the product, in the system, and in the authorities that, that govern it. After we spoke on Thursday afternoon, Football Index announced that they'd be going into administration. And then following that, the Gambling Commission said that they would be suspending Football Index's license. So I reached out to Dave again to get his reactions. So my initial reaction was shock, even though the funny thing is we knew it was coming, it was likely to happen. It still was quite shocking that it's happened this quickly since the restructure that was recently announced. We're all in a bit of mourning, to be honest with you. Like the, the traders that have enjoyed and loved this platform for so many years, that have used it every day, that as we, we touched on before, we have this big community which everyone gets along. We all share ideas and speak about our passion and our love for football. It's almost just disappeared overnight. And it's left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths, but also it's left the door open so that there being a possibility of a takeover or some form of through a ministry of help, like a restructure of management, we, we, we're not sure where the next sort of steps lie, but it's a very sad time for, for all the football index users at the moment. As I mentioned, the gambling commission suspended their license. Does that feel just a little bit, a little too late? Absolutely. Absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there. If there were these problems that have influenced them to take these steps to 
suspend the license. Why has that happened now? Why has it happened when it was too late? The, the company's just suspended the platform. None of us can withdraw any money. There's nothing else that we can do at this moment in time. And they've then at that point decided to suspend the, the platform. If you listen to rumors that this may have been in the pipeline for a while, and that may be why Football Index made the decisions that they did. It's something that will come out over time. We don't know for any facts uh, about that situation at the moment, but it is possible that Football Index saw this coming and did whatever they thought was necessary to try and avoid it uh, or to wrap up the platform and take as much money out when they had the opportunity. But I think we'll have to wait a long time before we find out the true facts behind what's happened here. If you had the opportunity to speak to Football Index directly, what would you tell them? So that would be the dream for me, to actually sit down and have a conversation with these people to try and understand why they have done what they've done. I can understand a business needs to make money, and I can understand if they're not making money that they needed to make changes to stop the bleed. And knowing the community as I do in Football Index, knowing the passion and love for the product, what I would have liked to have seen is the communication from Football Index to be so much better. For them to come out, like I say, they haven't apologized. They haven't taken ownership of the situation. So the, the simple fact they're sending out an email saying, well, guys, you didn't deposit enough money, so I'm sorry, we're going to reduce dividends. That's pathetic. You know, How can you turn around and say to people that it's their responsibility that you have run your business poorly? You know, We're looking at these these excuses that are coming out from them that you know they're sending out information to people saying well you should have gambled more responsibly and that is a real kick in the teeth to people yes okay some of this including myself spent more money than we should have done that, that's obvious okay whether i've overexposed myself or not it's not not up for question but yes i've spent a lot of money but it's because i've backed a product and believed in it You know, if I was to go out and invest in a new tech company, I would have invested at those levels and expected them to to have some return. Maybe if it's not now in five years time, I looked at FI in the same way as a company that really progressive and on the up. And I, like I say, they put out a lot of statements saying how strong their financial position was. So what I would really want to get across them is like you're, you're communicating with people and almost making traders feel like this is their fault that this is an issue that they've bought upon themselves when it isn't. You know, they should have run their company more responsibly. And before you go, if you like today's episode, why not subscribe to our Patreon page where you'll get access to bonus episodes and extra content. The music for this episode was provided by Blue Dot Sessions, and you can find more information about the music in the episode show notes. This episode was produced by myself and John McKenzie. I'm Josh Schneiderweiler. Thanks for listening to Football Today.